This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. And now, Bob Cordaro. Great good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. My name is Bob Cadaro, and this is The Bob Cadaro Show on TV. I'm a native son of this region, born, raised, and returned. As many of you know, I do radio five days a week on WILK, appointment radio, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And now we do this thing, The Bob Cadaro Show on TV, each week, 11.30 a.m. here on WNEP-TV, Channel 16. Well, I love it here. This is home, and I love the people. From living in big cities around the country, I learned to appreciate that this is the best place on the planet. And I feel the need for us to let each other know how great it is here. We need to believe it. I've been around you and known you all my life. You are great workers, innovators, business people. You're the best of mothers, fathers, friends, neighbors, and human beings. You are the greatest patriots, soldiers, citizens, and Americans. You are America. This won't be like the radio show I do every day, however. On WILK, we do a lot of politics, a lot of criticism, and a lot of opinions. For this TV show, we want to accentuate the positive to feature those who have achieved and have or want connections to this region. So it's a whole different ballgame, the Bob Cadaro Show on TV. Today, we switch it up a bit. There will be no separate health segment. Today, Dr. Brian France and I, we'll talk to Sister Mary Alice Jaquinot, President and CEO of St. Joseph's Center. As a regular part of this program, we occasionally feature, as our Power Brunch Players of the Week, people who make healthcare work, who provide essential services to the community, and do it for the entire show. Sister Mary Alice Jaquinot and St. Joseph's Center deserve this type of spotlight. We are going to explore the history of St. Joseph's, exactly what it is that they do, and how that impacts our community. My own family has a long and deep history with St. Joseph. My nephew, Anthony, my brother Ron's firstborn, who developed incredible disabilities due to meningitis after birth, spent three years at St. Joe's. His profound illness is being cared for by the loving staff there. Since then, Ron has chaired an annual golf tournament, which benefits St. Joseph's. And we've become intimately familiar with this amazing facility. So, with the help of God, our families, our communities, and each other's, let us begin. And now, the Sunday Brunch Power Player of the Week on the Bob Cordaro Show. We're joined by Sister Mary Alice Jaquinot, and she is the president and CEO of St. Joseph's Center. One of the... I, to me, one of the most vital institutions that this area has, one of the most special places, maybe on earth. I, I, I don't think I exaggerate there. Sister, first of all, welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. So tell us the history. Well, I, I want to go one step back. Tell us about yourself. Okay. Well, how does Sister Jacquinot get here? Okay, sure. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about St. Joseph Center, so we'll spend more time on that. But uh, with regard for, to myself, um, I'm fr- originally from Scranton. My parents, Marianne and Jerry Jaquinot, live in South Scranton, where I grew up. I attended public schools here. I went to Bishop Klonowski High School and Bishop Hannon High School, Marywood University. And throughout that time, I certainly felt the call to religious life. Uh, yeah. I was taught by the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and sort of had an inkling that that might be um, the right vocation for me. So uh, I worked at Marywood a number of years and entered the community in 1994 Mm. and uh, made my first vows in 1997. Wow! And I've had wonderful ministry opportunities and somewhat uniquely all of my years as a IHM sister have been in Lackawanna County. I spent time at Marion Community Hospital in Carbondale and at Marywood University and Friends of the Poor and now at St. Joseph Center. Wow. I, it's a whole other show, the, the calling. Uh, we got to do that sometime. Just okay. promise we will do sure, that. Because sure. this is, this is mm-hmm. about St. Joseph. 
But I, I said, what a, an incredibly special place St. Joseph's is. It's also been around for a long time. Tell us a little bit about the, the history. Well, as we enter 2023, we're really looking at 135 years. So uh, the story of how St. Joe's began is really a very beautiful and simple story. Um, you know, that idea of what happens when caring people get together and try and, and solve a problem. So on November 20th, 1888, mm. the sister who was the mother superior of the IHM congregation invited women who were active in the local community, probably with their churches, uh, to come together and plan for the needs of those who were children who were considered the abandoned poor. So they were children whose parents couldn't parent them, most likely for the reasons of poverty. We know our local history. So if the father was killed in the coal mines, uh, the mother might find herself without a home mm -hmm. and without income or extended family to help her raise her children. It, that, that long, that, that, that's, that's remarkable. They saw the need. <clears throat> The sisters saw the need. They stepped up. They raised money in the community, obviously. The, the old grand dame of the building over there, is a, Brian had told me, is a 1900 structure. Right. Uh, that's yeah, it's, it's, it's a great testament to what volunteers can do. So the first group of eight women uh, were all volunteers, and they brought children into their own home and cared for them. Uh, two years later, in 19... 90 or 1890 sorry it became a more formal um, ministry and service in the community and um, right away began to um, acquire buildings and in 1900 moved to 2010 adams avenue the big yellow building that we know so well well oh, right sister um on a personal note i, I also want to thank you for uh, taking the time to be here with us today and you know i know you have such a busy schedule so th you know thank you um, leading up to this, you know, when we were originally talking about this, I had indicated that part of, you know, what we like to do with this show is to put a spotlight on healthcare facilities uh, in northeastern Pennsylvania and the very vital role that they play. Uh, would you mind just sort of, I, I've watched St. Joseph's grow, you know, over the last in my lifetime, now probably 50 years or so, and it's obviously much more than, you know, when I was a young man going to the picnics and having fun there. But um, would you mind telling us, you know, how it's evolved, how it's grown, and what, what is the array of health care uh, services that you provide today? Well, thank you. And thanks for the invitation to be here. As I said, my talking about St. Joe's is one of my favorite things. So uh, the history is phenomenal and really rooted in this community. So that early um, ministry was to be an orphanage to provide care for children whose parents <clears throat> couldn't take care of them. And many adoptions occurred um, directly from the big yellow building at 2010 Adams Avenue. In the year 19, in the 1950s, the state of Pennsylvania began to ask places that were providing orphanage care to look at providing long-term care for children born with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Those we know today weren't necessarily defined at that time. So this was the first generation really surviving childbirth with complex disabilities. And so the thought was they'd have to have permanent uh, supportive residential. And so that's what St. Joe's began. And uh, today that main center is licensed as an intermediate care facility. But really the people we support uh, across the, the spectrum of need and their age, we have a great number of, of services. So not everyone needs 24-hour residential. For those who do, we have that service. But we also have a lot of community-based programs for individuals, whether they're young and living at home. We have our early intervention or our Trinity Child Care Center, which is a daycare, the only uh, local daycare for medically fragile children. Uh, we have one-on-one -on -one support services for those with intellectual disabilities living with their families or independently in the community. And we're very proud of our outpatient therapy services. Uh, we have an aquatic therapy program, a pool heated to 92 degrees, which just allows for therapy to occur uh, for those who might be at risk of falling. It, it just really releases a lot of muscle tension. And, and from a staffing point of view, you know, the very unique challenges that, that you face at St. Joe's, uh, with your with your inpatients residents, 
Tell us about the staff. What sort of you know training do they need? Are they you know is, are are they are they difficult to find? Is there are you having problems with staffing? That, that's exactly what jumped to my mind when she was telling us about mm, the mm. sophistication yeah. that mm. your facility and staff have to be uh, have to have to, mm. to take care of these profoundly uh, injured children. Right. We really do need staff who are very compassionate and who are good learners. Because each person we serve, their, unique, their needs are unique uh, to them. So it, it's not, you know, one size fits all care. Uh, quite a few are in wheelchairs, you know, rely on the use of wheelchairs. Uh, some have more complicated health conditions that need really nursing intervention. So the workforce uh, crisis that exists um, in this time uh, locally uh, as well, we're impacted by that. Uh, I am so grateful and have tremendous respect for our direct care staff. Um, you know, to see them on Christmas Day or Thanksgiving mm -hmm. or Easter there in our 24-hour programs, um, maybe knowing that they won't celebrate with their family until 4 o'clock in the afternoon or something. They're just really dedicated. Uh, they develop meaningful relationships with the people who uh, they support. Uh, some are nonverbal, and yet they communicate beautifully with their direct care staff. So we are always looking for people who have a compassionate heart, who are willing to learn. Uh, it's not necessary to come with a prior experience or formal education. Uh, most of it is on-the-job training. You know, it's, a, it's amazing, isn't it? Compassion, how that transcends health care. Right. And successful health care was interesting uh, that you mentioned that was the first word that uh, that came out. And, uh, you know, I, I completely understand that um, it, structurally. Um, you were telling us a, a little bit. I think most of what you were describing actually goes on right at St. Joe's. Are there community uh, facilities that do other, uh, you know, areas of health care for you? Sure. We do have uh, community homes. We have 12 in Lackawanna County, two in Luzerne County. Uh, we have an adult day center, so individuals who are over the age of 21, they've graduated from their special education programs, and they're not really capable of competitive work. So we have adult day programs at three sites. Uh, we Our Trinity program is located in Dunmore, and um, a lot of our programs that are community-based might happen in an individual's home, such as early intervention or our community support services. Uh, could occur, you know, anywhere in the community. Because a big part of the evolution of our services is from institution-based to community-based or community integration. Mm -hmm. So really making sure that people have um, access to their community, uh, depending on their ability and, and their interests. And most of the people we support do need to do that with one-on-one -on -one staffing. Mm -hmm. Again, because of the wheelchair and transportation, and uh, maybe that they can't communicate directly, their own safety. You know, and, and, you know, given the complexity of that, the structure and the vast array of services that you're providing, um, how does St. Joseph's actually, from a financial standpoint, keep up with all of that? Well, we um, do receive reimbursement from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the services that we provide because at one point everyone was cared for in state-sponsored centers. And so we're a private provider of services, so we are compensated by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But that only goes so far. Um, our rates often are fixed um, year over year, and we do advocate for increases, but we also are able to supplement with fundraising. So. Um, a lot of our fundraising goes into the support of our maternity residential program. So I described what we started doing uh, in 1888 as we evolved into providing services for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We continued to provide support for uh, families and particularly s single mothers um, who may find themselves pregnant and experiencing homelessness or with an infant child and experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our fundraising supports those programs. Uh, we do have adoption services. We have a large mm -hmm. baby and children's mm -hmm. pantry that's available to mm -hmm. the community. So fundraising is absolutely an essential mm -hmm. part of what we do at St. Joseph Center. Because that's the state budget, not your budget. That's correct, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. And we're, we're very fortunate because we've been in this community so long, we do receive the support 
Um, you know, I, I can't count the number of donors, but from those who can give, you know, um, a small amount to those who can give large, and uh, everyone then feels a sense of ownership or pride right. in the work that we do at St. Joe's. You know, uh, tell us, uh, as I understand that you have, there's a foundation, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and sort of how that help, how that helps? And Sure. We, the foundation was formed uh, probably in the 1980s, and it has its own board, and it primarily uh, raises, holds, and distributes funds mm -hmm. uh, for the services needed at St. Joe's. That really allows us uh, to renovate areas. Uh, it takes a long time and a lot of mm -hmm. money, as you know, to maybe renovate a room in your own home. Well, imagine renovating all the bedrooms I've just sure. named right. and all of, all of the kitchens and um, all the physical properties that we have. Uh, so fundraising certainly helps with that. Anytime we can apply for a grant from a foundation, they might ask for a local match. So our fundraising would support that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another aspect of the foundation is, is grant writing and um, receiving memorial donations uh, at the time of somebody's passing. The family might give uh, gifts to St. Joe's. Uh, many people fortunately do remember us in their uh, legacy and their bequests, uh, which helps us uh, qu quite a bit. Sister, uh, how many, just to get a concept of the scope of it, it's a big facility, just the one, and then you mentioned, what, 11 or 13 About facilities? 14 group homes, yeah. So how, what's, how many people work for you? Well, we should have 650. Uh, we're probably in and around 550. Um, that has, you know, part of the difficulty of uh, retention um, that has occurred uh, really since the pandemic. The nature of the work uh, became a little bit difficult for people. Um, again, I'm grateful for the staff we have, so I don't only want to speak about the staff yeah. that we need because we do have uh, phenomenal staff. What's the financial scope of the operation? I mean, it's not a small operation in any way, shape, or form. No, it's it's around forty million today. So it's, uh, again, a, a lot of uh, services, a lot of different services, you know, our outpatient services, um, as well as our residential and community base. Whenever you have a service that's going 24 hours a day, and we have many of them, you need a lot more staff. And, and of course, uh, our number one expense would be wages and benefits. Uh, you had taken care of my nephew, uh, AJ Anthony, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just saw firsthand <laughs> I had always known it and always mm -hmm. suspected, as we we all did. And then, when when you took care of uh, my brother Ron and, and his uh, wife Karen's son, it, I I just saw such extraordinary care and involvement that was it was off the charts. I'm really I get to take credit for the work of our direct care and nursing staff and our therapy staff all the time. I uh, feel so privileged to witness that. Uh, yesterday, I had a phone call from a woman who had her nursing training there in 1950s. So it's sort of a legacy. I think we've yeah. inherited from the IHM congregation. You know, there, we've always had a presence. We are uh, the sponsors in the name of the church. Uh, but really, the compassion, um, as you said, is really the first and foremost. So yes, there is skill, and there's healthcare knowledge and, and technology that supports but it's the compassion and the love. And our, our staff really embrace the residents as if they're family members. They don't take the place of family, mm -hmm. but they care like family. Uh, just to go back for, for a second, and uh, you know, I have to tell you, listening to you, I feel so humbled, you know, listening to you know, all of what you do and how you do it and the compassion that with, the, with what you do it with. And um, I guess this it's probably a natural lead into my question, and that is, you know, what can, you know, aside from fundraising and financial, you know, contributions, what can the community do to help St. Joseph's? Well, thanks for that question. Um, you know, first and foremost, pray for our ministry. Um, pray that we find the right staff always uh, to provide that compassionate care. Uh, financial support and supporting uh, fundraising events. We also have um, an auxiliary that's been affiliated with um, St. Joseph since its foundation in 1888. So a group of uh, men and women and teenagers who fundraise and do all kinds of activities. Um, also, I think volunteering, uh, creating a welcoming community. Uh, it is unfortunate when we hear 
stories that maybe a staff took a resident with intellectual disability who maybe vocalizes differently to church and they felt unwelcome or to the movies or to a community festival. Mm -hmm. We don't have that too much, but I think creating a welcoming community, creating opportunities uh, for people with developmental disabilities, maybe to have work or to have volunteering or welcoming, feeling yeah. welcomed in their community. I have a question too, just in, in terms of, um, you know, years ago <clears throat> when I first started my practice, Bill Yeomans did a, a, a local dentist. Uh, he sort of was the head of the, uh, head of the, uh, the dental uh, component of that. Where is that today? Who is looking out for the dental aspect of the residents? We have uh, two dentists, and their father was a pediatrician, Dr. Tom oh. um, Zukowski, yeah. and so Megan, Megan Azar and, okay, and uh, Bridget Walsh yeah. are there. And we have a wonderful dental hygienist, Maureen Holzman, mm -hmm. and, and she does instruct Excellent. all of our care, all of our staff on oral care. We take that very seriously because, you know, if you don't mm -hmm. eat by mm -hmm. mouth, uh, if you don't eat by mouth, you have to make sure your dental care is really managed very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that interest. Well, yeah. yeah, no, I, was, I knew he would yeah. get to it sooner or later. <laughs> well, sure, why, why not? That's why we're here. Uh, you know, just from a on a personal note, and I know that you're so busy. What do you, what what are your hobbies? What do you like to do in your spare time? That's a great question. I like to spend. I do like to cook. I like to spend time with my my friends, other sisters, and my family. And um, my summertime hobby is to golf. Oh, a little bit. Okay. Not a particularly good golfer, but I do enjoy. Yeah. Well, Ron got us out with the tournament, mm -hmm. and so there's lots of tournaments locally. Right. So that opportunity is. Did is you play there. with Joe Theismann this summer? I didn't. I was a little too late. <laughs> I guess he, he got on a plane to go somewhere else, but I did miss him. But yeah, that was a great tournament. Sister, what do you see as the future? Brian talked to you, and you you responded about the evolution of the facility, mm -hmm. evolution of your services. What do you see as the future? We're, we're well into the 21st century. Sure. Needs change, <clears throat> technology changes. You mentioned staffing issues, uh, all the things you deal with. What do you see as the future of St. Joseph's Center and its entire complex? I think con to continue with community-based services so that people with, especially children with disabilities could continue to live with their families. So we have a medical fra uh, daycare for medically fragile. We're hoping to have a second site soon. We have it under the name of Trinity Child Care Center, and we've reached a capacity of 60. So we do need to go to a second site. But that way, that child or children, in some cases, multiple children from the same family, are with their parents, but their parents go out to work. So continuing, continuing to have community-based services um, individualized services is so key. So we do have a large facility and that'll always be needed for, especially for those who need nursing care and therapy. Uh, but for families who could support their loved one at home to make sure that they have the supports that they need as well. I've had that question often, knowing families who've had people with, and, and children with profound disabilities. Uh, and, and you look, and over the years, you say the parents are getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is going to happen to this child? What is going to happen actually to this adult mm -hmm. <clears throat> that still has uh, profound issues in their life? What, what happens to them? Is this part of the mission that St. Joseph Center does? It really is. And it's one of the hardest conversations when parents who have provided love and care for their adult child and they be, become concerned about their ability to continue that. So uh, we do have, again, community homes, um, sometimes support for that individual to live um, in their own apartment, maybe in their family home, but to get some support um, as they need it. So, And I do think uh, we talked a little bit about the advancement of technology, mm -hmm. you know, more telehealth, more, um, you know, information technology that maybe could allow for some safe monitoring or check-ins without somebody having to necessarily leave their house or come and, and you know have some a contact come right inside but remote monitoring things like that as you, the individual wants you touched on it earlier uh, you have remarkable staff remarkable compassion you've you have 
volunteers and boards and and groups that have been in the forefront of your fundraising. And I, I know a lot of them mm-hmm. and they're just great people. And then just your everyday volunteers at the pantry and, and elsewhere. Uh, do you see that staying stable, that the people are continue to participate uh, and help St. Joseph's that way? Absolutely. Um, so many people get, have a, an experience of St. Joe's and they want to stay involved. Uh, we have auxiliary presidents who were involved in the 70s who continue to volunteer at the summer festival. Uh, we have people who volunteer at our baby pantry, like yeah. your mother, and yeah. maybe they're not active uh, day to day, but they continue to support that work. So uh, we are really blessed with a lot of advocates in the community, and we use that word in a lot of different ways, uh, but people who really champion the mission of St. Joe's, and um, we're, we're just really blessed. I, I do think the history and the mission of St. Joe's is really integrated into our community. It, it truly is, and Sister, thank you so much. We were happy the we're happy the Jackronauts gave you to us oh, from Southside, <laughs> uh, and and pleased to have you with us here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Thank you. Thank you. What a remarkable facility, remarkable story, remarkable woman. Uh, Honored to have her with us today. St. Joseph's Center has been a a pillar of this community, caring for those who need it the most for, what, 130 years now? Uh, I I get, uh, I don't know, I get touched every time I think of the place. I hope you do too. And I hope that some of you, Take this opportunity to step up and help St. Joseph's Center. It performs an incredibly valuable mission. Well, that's it for another edition of the Bob Cadaro Show on TV. So happy you're with us. We'll be back next Sunday, 1130 a.m. on WNEP-TV, the Bob Cadaro Show on TV. Thanks for being part of the program. You've got an appointment every Sunday morning at 1130 right here on WNEP-TV. The Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cadaro Show on TV.